It's not uncommon for Christians to call themselves disciples of Jesus. And that's not too surprising, because disciple just means follower, and Christians are followers of Jesus. But in Mark 8, 34, Jesus offers a much stricter definition of disciple. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Clearly, there's much more to being a disciple of Jesus than a simple click to subscribe. So exactly what is a disciple of Jesus? Up to this point, the Gospel of Mark has presented Jesus as superior in every way. He has unlimited power over physical matters, like sickness, and spiritual matters, like the human heart. Jesus proves he can solve global suffering and bring world peace. But Jesus first came not to end the world's troubles, but to suffer and die for sin. Sin is the reason the world is broken, and it can only be fixed when sin is gone. Jesus must suffer and die to satisfy the consequences of sin. And what Jesus, in Mark 8, 34, is calling his disciples to do is a powerful picture of what he is about to do. A disciple, then, is someone who takes his faith in Christ seriously. But how do you do this? You must first come to the end of yourself. That's what it means to deny yourself. You reject who you are, your goals, your desires, your sin, to follow his ways instead. How far must you go? You must be willing to die for Christ. That's what it means to take up your cross. You are committed to the point of shame and death. How long must it take? As long as it takes. That's what it means to follow Jesus. You never stop fighting to make Jesus your authority over every part of your life. That's a disciple of Jesus. That may sound hard, but here's the good news. Anyone willing to deny himself and follow Christ, no matter the cost, will be forgiven, will be saved, and will be his disciple. Hi, Rock Church, how are we doing this morning? All right. All right, well, it's good to see everybody. My name is Andy Clark. I'm one of the pastors here. Hope you're having a great morning. Um, we're so excited about today because we are continuing our series called Marks of a Disciple, where, where after Jesus was, was crucified and he was buried and rose again, he still had the marks on his hands signifying that he was Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ, and that he was set apart from everyone else in the world. And so as Christians, we can bear our marks as a disciple as well. And so what we're doing is we're going over different characteristics that we can try to obtain in our, in our Christian walk to be more like Jesus. So last week, we talked about trusting God. A disciple in Christ has to trust him. All right, We're not going to get uh, really far in our relationship and our walk with him if we're not trusting him. So we talked about what that looks like in some different areas of our lives. That maybe, you know, are we really trusting God in? So if you want to listen to that, you can go to hrclex.life and you can listen to any uh, message on there as well. So today what we're going to talk about is something that I feel like is like a lost art now today in modern Christianity. But it's probably, to me, it's probably one of the biggest ways that we come closer to God. All right. And so today we're going to talk about fasting. We're going to talk about fasting. And you might say, well, okay, well, I don't really know what fasting is. Well, if you don't know what fasting is, it is not the opposite of slowing. Okay? <laughs> Thanks, I'll be here all day. Don't forget to tip your waitress. Right? <laughs> also, we're not talking about fast fooding. Okay, we're not fast fooding. Sorry to disappoint anybody. We're not having a heart attack for Jesus today. Okay, we're not talking about that. Uh, we're talking about fasting. So fasting simply put, is where we abstain from certain foods or maybe certain objects for a period of time in order to grow spiritually. And I know today's not the day to be talking about abstaining from food or from objects like TV or something, because I know tonight's the Super Bowl, and I know we all got our chicken wings and our pizza and our chips and dip, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm making me some homemade jalapeno poppers myself, so I mean, you know, so... I'm ready for it, man. So I know today is not the day to be talking about it, but don't check out on me quite yet, all right, because we're going to talk about some fasting today. So to start off, we're going to be in the book of Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at two uh, popular ver uh, scripture on, on, uh, on fasting, this, uh, 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 Matthew 6 and Isaiah 58. But before we dig into Matthew 6, uh, we'll help understand what Jesus is saying a little better by digging, 
by looking at an overview of fasting in the Bible. Now, this isn't every occurrence, but we can see how fasting goes through the Bible. In Exodus, Moses fasted before he received the Ten Commandments. In Leviticus 16, God makes fasting a lasting ordinance after the Day of Atonement. In Judges, Israel fasts after losing a great battle. In 1 Samuel, uh, the nation of Israel fasts to express grief after King Saul died. In 2 Chronicles, Jehoshaphat, the king, calls a fast before they go into war. In the book of Psalms, we see that people are fasting in order to know God more. In the book of Daniel, Daniel fasts in order to receive uh, guidance from God and also be stronger than the other prisoners. In Jonah, he fasted after God saved the Ninevites because he realized he wasn't being too humble about that. The book of Nehemiah, like we learned in last series, uh, Nehemiah fasted before he built the wall. And then after the wall was built, he called for a fast as well. Even in the New Testament, in the book of Mark, John's disciples asked Jesus' disciples, they asked Jesus why his disciples are not fasting like them and the, and the Pharisees' disciples are. Jesus fast before his temptation from the devil. In the book of Luke, we see that there is a prophetess that stays in the temple praying and fasting all the time. In the book of Acts, multiple places of fasting. We see where Paul was fasting whenever he had the scales on his eyes. We see the other, uh, uh, other uh, followers of Christ were also fasting as well to make decisions with. So we see that fasting is all throughout the Bible. And followers of God have been doing it for thousands of years. So in the book of Matthew, in the book of Matthew chapter 16, with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, He's just talking about different things that, uh, you know, followers of God do in the kingdom of God. He gets, he gets done talking about prayer, and he says in verse 16, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting but only to your father, who is unseen. And your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. But we see that uh, fasting is all throughout the Bible. So when Jesus is talking to his followers, to the Jewish followers, he says, when you fast. He doesn't say, you know, if you fast, or hey, there's this thing called fasting, if you ever get around to it. In case you want to try it, let me just kind of give you some pointers on this. No, he says, when you fast. So it shows that fasting was the common way of life. It was common in the way of life all throughout the whole Bible. Even to the point, like, like whenever kings would call a fast for Israel, he just said, hey guys, we need to fast. And everybody's like, okay, sure, I'm on board with it. You know, they weren't like, fasting? I mean, what's that? And the king's like, okay, well, come over here. Let's have a little get-together on, on how to fast, right? People just knew how to fast. It was part of life for them. So it just interests me how fasting is all throughout the Bible. It's a common way of life. Jesus expects us to do it when he says, when you fast. And so that's why we're including it in marks of a disciple because followers of God, like I say, have been fasting for thousands of years. But for some reason... It's just not big in modern Christianity today. Somehow we have lost this practice of fasting and the importance of it. I mean, some of us may have heard of fasting before, okay? Uh, I know my dad, he was a devout religious man, all right? And so he fasted when I was younger. I've seen him fast, but I never really knew, like, how to do it or the benefits from it until I started fasting about 10 years ago. And then I realized, man, this is like a life-changing event. I mean, it really did. It changed my walk with God. And I don't know, honestly, I don't know why it's not a very popular thing today. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe it's our culture. You know, our culture is taught to indulge. We're not very big on going without. We're, you know, we're Basically, I want more and I want it now, so maybe going without food or maybe a certain object for a period of time, it's just not too enticing to the common ear. And also, too, maybe we've heard about it as maybe a health trend. When I was researching this message, I read a very popular worldwide magazine, and it said that right now, fasting is one of the great health and fitness trends. 
And I'm like, wow, you know, we've turned this great thing to be able to know God more, this great thing that God's followers have been doing for thousands of years, and now we've turned it into a trend, which kind of scares me because, I mean, think about the trends the world has. I mean, I'm not really big on trends right now, but I know some of them. Like, I remember one was like, drink as much milk as you can until you throw up. <laughs> that's where our society's gotten to, right? Like, that's what's entertainment for us. That's a trend. Or maybe the trend our kids went through where they learned how to floss, you know, and, like, kids couldn't stand still for, like, six months. Like, everywhere they go, they're just doing this everywhere, you know, like they're walking down the road. And I'm like, are you okay? Like, are you, like, too much sugar or something? Like, what's going on? I was, I'm flossing. Okay, I don't know what flossing is, see. So it's like, see, so now we've taken this great thing and we've dumbed it down to a worldly trend. We've taken the spirituality out of it, and now it's just for health, and now it's just become a trend, something that we're going to do for a little while and toss to the side again whenever something else becomes more popular. And see, fasting is way more than that. Fasting is so much more than that. So now I'm going to look at Isaiah chapter 58, and we can look at what, what, what fasting is, okay, and like the true benefits from it. So Isaiah... It's towards the middle of our Bible, and we see Isaiah 58, and we're going to start in verse 2. He says, for, this is God speaking, for day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commandments of his God. They ask me for just decisions. They seem eager eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on a day of fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. So God's speaking about this fast, and he's like, okay, you seem eager to know me, right? Like, you seem like you want to get to know me more, and so you're choosing this fasting to get to know me, which there isn't anything wrong with that. But he's just saying, look, whenever you're fasting, you're, you're viewing it wrong, right? Like, for one thing, you're just still doing the same old thing you were doing in a normal part of life. You're not really doing anything different. You're just not eating for a day. And also, too, you're fighting and you're quarreling through all of this. Like, you're missing the whole point here. And maybe the reason why they're fighting and arguing is because they're not eating for a day. And they're upset about it. And so he brings out a good point here is that a lot of the way we view fasting has a lot to do with, with the results we get from. And if we're going to try it at all. If all we do in fasting is focusing on what we're not eating or what we can't have, then yes, we're going to miss the whole point. Right? We're not going to get any closer to God if all we sit around and do is think about, well, my stomach's hungry and I can't look at Facebook or whatever, you know, then, then see, we're missing the whole point here. And that's not the way we should view fasting. So as we keep reading, God gives more meaningful ways to, to do this. So as we look at verse 6, God says, Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? To set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? So God's saying instead of sitting around focusing on what we can't have, why don't we start doing the things that we know God wants us to do in these moments? Like for instance, instead of sitting around and eating celery and thinking about we wish we were eating pizza, why don't we order that pizza for somebody that we know is in need and send it to their house instead? Just because we're not eating it doesn't mean somebody else can't. Or just because we, you know, we're not looking at Facebook right now, instead of sitting there wondering what everybody's posting and what everybody's talking about, he's like, go out to the community and have conversations with people. Go out and evangelize. Or instead, or that time we would have sat in our lazy boy chairs, sitting there flipping through our phones for hours upon hours. He's like, spend that time with your family instead. Or here's a good idea. Read the Word. Read the Word. Pray. Like, like come closer to me. See, and that's what God is saying here. Like, let this hunger remind us what we're truly fasting about. When we spend these times and moments, 
When we spend these moments in prayer and we spend them in the Word and we start seeking God, our fasting becomes a whole different experience. It becomes what God starts talking about in verses 8 and 9. He says, Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear God. Guard, and then, I w- and then you will call, and the Lord will answer, and you will cry for help, and I will say, here am I. See, never we take fasting, never we truly look at it for what it really is, never we apply the things that God wants us to do in it. He's like, then our light will shine forth. Then we'll start seeing light on the subject matters that we're truly fasting about. You will call on me, and I'll say, here am I. God's always here. He hasn't went anywhere, right? So, like, so like, we're blocking him off with other things, and so whenever we start praying, whenever we start seeking him, we truly read our Bibles, and we do these things we know to do in this fasting, then we'll have a deeper connection with God, and we'll know God is there. And he's like, yes, and then you'll feel my glory, right? Then your healing will come. Like these things you are looking for, if you look at fasting more than just, well, this is something that I can't have or something that I can't can't do when we look at what we can truly gain from fasting spiritually that's whenever we have the true experience that we're really wanting because fasting helps in so many areas of our lives I don't even think we know how many areas like one area is to overcome sin like Isaiah said to break the chains of oppression Right, one reason we fast is to overcome sin. So many times we get caught in sin and we're like, man, I, you know, what do I need to do to break this? So we start reading and we start praying more, which are all great things, but have we ever truly considered that fasting is a means to do this as well? Jesus says that some demons only come out by prayer and fasting. Also, it's hard to stop doing something while we're still doing it. So if we make that commitment while we're fasting to stop doing it, that's going to help us start getting some distance away from what's truly bothering us. Then the light and the truth can come in better. There's another reason to repent, to truly repent. See, we can fast and just repent. It's easy to get off track in our walk with God and need to get back to Him or turn around. Like, so never repenting. Say, okay, God, I really am sorry. So I'm going to literally suffer to just, to, to just come closer to you. And I fasted for this reason before, just to get back on track, just to get back to God. Another reason, outside of sin and repentance and all those ones we know about, to seek guidance. To seek guidance from God. To get answers from Him. A lot of times there's so much noise around us. There's so many voices speaking to us. It's hard to hear from God. So in these moments when we're really trying to hear from God, that we really want answers, never we want to seek the direction of our lives, we can fast to cut out all these things that block us off from God, and we can receive guidance better. So if you're wondering something from God, if you're needing answers, well, here's a great way to help receive those is fasting. And lastly, in this little category we're talking about here, to strengthen our relationship with God. Simply. Just, just to strengthen our relationship with God. This is the exact reason why I started fasting. Uh, because I'd seen somebody else who was doing it. And I was interested. And I just tried it. And I just wanted a better relationship with God. But once I started fasting, I was like, wow. This has so much value in my life. And so, yeah. You know, we just want to strengthen our relationship with God. And see, everything doesn't have to be wrong for us to fast. We can just fast out of worshiping God. Hey, God, I love you. You know, I just want to be closer to you. This is the way I can do it. I just want to humble myself and show you that you're the king. I just want to do it because everything is going right. So, yeah, see, to strengthen our relationship. Because if we think about, like, our relationship with God and getting back on track, a lot of times we think in terms of, like, addition. I need to add things in my life. I need to add more Bible, more prayer, uh, more connect group, more Bible study, which are great things. But we also have to realize that the soul grows by subtraction as well. We don't always grow by addition. Sometimes we grow by subtraction. See, we subtract from the flesh and we add to the spirit. Because honestly, I don't think we realize how much we cut God out of our lives and replace him for things in this world. You know, like there's so many opportunities we have in our 
in, in our every day to let God work, to let God move, to build our faith. And what we've done is we just come up with replacements from God. We just replace them from different things in this world, and we don't even know that we do it. Like I said, the first time I fasted, I had no idea how much I just ran to things instead of running towards God. Even food, even food. How many of us wake up in the morning needing energy, and we just naturally go make a cup of coffee instead of praying to God for energy? See, we could pray to God for that same energy. I mean, energy is a big deal. That's a billion-dollar, you know, market now. You know, we go through the day, we're tired, so we run to the store, we grab a monster instead of trying to have monster reliance on God. As soon as we get hungry, we go grab a cheeseburger or a salad, and, you know, we just go ahead and fill that tummy up real quick, and we don't even think about it, right? Those are moments that we could be spending with God. Those are things that we could do in order to have God work in our lives more. Or think about comfort food. We're sad or angry, so we go and we eat, right? We have comfort food. Those are moments, too, we could be depending on God. Or what about boredom? We eat because we're bored. Those are moments as well we could be spending with God. We could let God fulfill that need instead of just straight up running towards food. Or what about the object fast, right? We call them object fast, things that we do as well, like social media. I mean, we use social media for so many things. You know, the same way, we get sad or depressed, first thing we do, we flip out our phone and we start looking at what's going on, try to escape a little bit. You know, we want to escape from life, so we, so we pull out video games. Or we want connection with others, so we use social media for that. You know, we go try, try to have connection, so instead of sitting there spending time with God, we just flip it. And after a while, honestly, we're just flipping the flip through, right? Like, we've already looked at everything, we don't want anything else, we're just still going and going and going. Stop! Spend some time with God. And we look at the news and we look at everything, trying to find a glimmer of hope, hoping that the new strand isn't what it's going to be and all these other things, right? Like we're glued to the TV. Come on, TV, tell me something good, right? Like the world's going crazy. Come on, news channel. I need you to feed my spirit. I need you to feed my hope when the best hope we can have is spending time in the spirit of the Lord. See, I don't think we realize how much we cut out these opportunities for God to do this. So what we do in fasting is we cut all that out, right? We cut out the artificial replacements, and we put it with the real thing. We cut all that out because we realize that now we have nowhere to go but to God. We've cut out everything, and all we can do is go straight to God. And like I said, we learn so much in there. Like, like we learn for one uh, we learn a lot about ourselves, and we learn a lot about how we do replace God. We also learn a lot about God, how God can work in our lives in so many ways that we've never even thought God can give us strength through the day. And also, we see how many opportunities we have to build this faith in God that we miss. Like I said, we take out all that stuff, and we have nowhere to go but to God. But see, there's benefits in fasting. This is big. And I wanted to get into that before I get into how to fast, because like I said, fasting in our culture today isn't really that great, right? To cut things out that we like to do isn't really taught. We don't like to go hungry. We don't like to go without our social media. We don't like to go without our TVs, okay? So to, so to, so to hear us say that isn't very attractive. So when it comes to fasting, how do we fast? Well, a lot of times it includes food. So let me, let me say this in a way that Baptists can understand, okay? You know, in churches, we like to have potlucks where we have everything. We have meatballs and chicken and, and, and banana pudding and all that stuff, right? Like, we have potlucks. Well, fasting would be a pot unluck, okay? <laughs> That's a pot unluck. You take all that out. And basically, it's like all natural foods. Like if you ever heard of the Daniel Fast, you can look up something called the Daniel Fast if you've never fasted before. And I'll give you a lot of information. That's a traditional fast that a lot of people do in churches, all right? And basically, it's just natural foods. It's vegetables, fruits, beans, water, uh, anything that comes from a seed, all right? Anything that's grown from a seed. But then we cut out a lot of stuff. 
We're cutting out caffeine, sugar, no processed foods, no preservatives. Um, usually don't eat anything from an animal, no meat, no cheese, no yogurt, anything like that. So, yeah, we're talking about no coffee, no candy, uh, no cheeseburgers. So, I'm sorry, no McDonald's, no KFC, no Taco Bell. And I just lost 85% of people who are listening to me. I get that, right? <laughs> and I know it's tough, man. Trust me. I know. I, I mean, I'm writing this message. And I'm like, man, all this writing about fasting is making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I get it, right? And a lot of people think, well, Andy, that's just healthy eating, right? I mean, I like that anyway. That's the way I want to eat. And that's true. It is. Basically, it is. It's healthy eating. But it's, it's more than that. Because, see, in fasting, the point isn't to be full all the time. Fasting, the point is to, to be hungry, to rely on God, to know our need for God. So, like, in the morning, maybe we eat some whole grain oatmeal. Okay, we eat natural oatmeal. Maybe put a half a banana in it or something. And then that's it for a while. Because that will wear off pretty quick, and that's it. In an hour or two when we're hungry, now it's time to get down to business. Now, okay, God, woo, man, I'm at work. It's 10 o'clock. I got three hours till lunch. Oh, man, I'm hungry. And, man, I want to go to the fridge real quick and grab me a snack, or I want to jump in here and look at what fruit I got. Not, no, see, that's not the point. The point is to be hungry. The point is to rely on God. So while it may be healthy eating, it's not to eat till fulfillment, right? It's not just to, sit, to snack on fruit all day. It's so we can truly see our need for God and start cutting out these things, especially with the caffeine and the sugar. If you've never cut that out before in your life, Life, we can that is a big moment in our lives to cut that out to rely on God strictly for energy and strength but it is such a big moment in our lives when we realize God can provide us with the everyday energy that we need and so many times we think of God as like a a pinch league hitter or something he's there for emergencies and we and we reserve God for the big things and we just kind of take control of the little things well God wants the little things too God wants every single bit of it, and this helps God work in every single detail of our lives. So that's fasting with food, all right? That, we usually cut those things out. And traditionally, there's different periods that people will fast, all right? There's different periods. Like, for instance, uh, there's a one-day fast, okay? There's different ways people fast. There's a one-day fast. And usually for a day, people just won't eat. All right, like you have a big supper, you don't eat nothing the rest of the day, then you eat breakfast the following day. Or maybe liquids, maybe, uh, maybe you know, water, or possibly juice. Usually when you cut out food from a fast, then people will use juice because it has sugars in it, and that helps out a little bit. Um, so, we, so we have like the one-day fast of pretty much just nothing, okay, you just fast that day. Then there's a three-day fast. That, uh, now that's traditionally as well. Like I said, we, th- this isn't... Permit, right? This isn't like regulations, but this is just traditions of what uh, we do in the church world, our, our people will do to follow Christ. Uh, so a three-day fast, some people will do like a three-day juice fast, okay? This can be just liquids. Um, like I said, most people use juices because of the sugars and the way it helps out. It can be just water, but we can also do food for three days as well, all right? You can also do the food. And like I said, we've already talked about the different types of food that we eat. But any amount longer than that, we usually want to include food. Uh, you know, it's hard not to eat for a week. And if you've never fasted before, I wouldn't suggest that one just yet. Okay, I would suggest, you know, doing the food with anything longer. So we have anything from a week to three weeks. All right, a week to three weeks, like a week fast. And the longer we fast, the more benefits we get from it. Because honestly, if we're big on caffeine, if we're big on sugar, We'll have withdrawal from foods. The first, like the first day is pretty good, then day two and three can get a little rough because we're withdrawing from the foods that we eat, especially with sugar and caffeine. So like I said, anything past three days, I usually try to encourage people to do if you feel comfortable because once you start getting into the week, that's when we start feeling more benefits. So the longer we fast, the more beneficial it's going to be. So, you know, a week to three weeks. Like I said, the three week is something called the Daniel Fast, which is uh, – which is uh, something that we can see. And, like, they got cookbooks, and they got all kinds of information on different fasts like that. Now, so, so we can set a period up. We can say, okay, God, I'm going to fast for a week. And if we say we're going to fast for a week, I encourage you, stick with it. Stick with it. You know, if we say we're going to do it, do it. But also, too, we don't have to 
put on like any time period, especially you say we're fasting for like guidance or an answer. You know, like the Apostle Paul, when he had the scales on his eyes, he didn't eat or drink until he heard from God. And then once he heard from God, they picked him up and gave him food right off, right? He didn't say, okay, God, you got four days. Speak to me in four days. You know, he just fasted until until he heard his answer. And, you know, I've done that too. I needed answers. It took about five days. And then after five days, I prayed about it. I felt like God said, okay, you can break your fast. So I broke the fast. I didn't put a period on it. I wanted answers. I fasted until I got the answer. See, so we don't always have to put a time limit on it. But if we do put a time limit on it, I suggest ride it out, man. Ride that thing out. The last type of fast I've been hitting on is called the object fast. And anytime fasting's in the Bible, it has to do with food. Okay, it's always with food. But in our culture, and you know, as we grow in our Christianity, people do object fast, which is fine. You know, I'm not against that. It's good to include food in our object fast too, because it just enhances the experience. But sometimes we just get so caught up in social media, we get caught up on our cell phones and TV and stuff like that. So sometimes we just take a fast from them. Like, okay, I'm not going on social media for a week. Or, you know, I'm putting my cell phone down for a couple of days. I'm not looking at it. Or I'm going to quit listening to that certain music. I'm just going to listen to Christian music for a week or a month or something, right? Like I need to get closer to God. So these are what called object fasts where we just kind of unplug for a while. You know, we just kind of unplug, we get away from that. Like I said, these are good because, we, I, I, you know, I don't think we realize how much we let these feed our brains. And, you know, we don't seek God. we got plenty of time to read the Bible, honestly, but we just choose to do different things. And so, we, you know, you know we take out the things that we uh, replace with God and we get away from these and we get to the true source. And we call that an object fast. So people can do that too. And once again, you know, we can do it for a week, two weeks, three weeks, whatever you want to do, a day. However you want to play it out. Now, I will say, you can't fast from your children. Okay? (laughs) You can't fast from your children. It's not like, hey, you know, your kids need some food and they need some clothes. Oh, I'm doing a three-month child fast. Nah. (laughs) What? She's sick. She's practically grown. (laughs) No, can't, can't fast from your children. So sorry to disappoint some of you parents. So with all that being said, right, we've talked about the benefits of fasting. we talked about different ways. we talked about followers of Christ have been doing it for thousands of years. We're going to do a church fast. We're going to do a church fast. Um, you can join in if you want. I can't demand it from you, obviously. This is something that you're going to do on your own. It's not going to begin tomorrow. Monday It's going to begin the following, a week from tomorrow. All right, well, I'll let us get over our Super Bowl chicken wings and let them get out the way first, and then, and then we'll start fasting, okay? So we're going to do it, and I'm going to do it for a week, okay? I'm, I'm going to encourage you to try to do it for a week. Now, granted, if you have medical condition, okay, I'm not a doctor, and if you have health concerns, I understand that totally. So you might want to check with your doctor first, okay, and see if there's any regulations you want to do. That's between you and your doctor, all right? And if it takes longer than a week to get to your doctor, if you want to fast, get with me after that, and we'll talk about fasting and help you out with that. But so I want to do a week church fast. So we're going to fast for a week, but you pray about it. Maybe you join in for a day. Maybe you join in for three days. Maybe you join in for five or you do the whole week. Or maybe you go three weeks, okay, whatever. But I'm just going to encourage us as the body of Christ to fast together, to start this fasting. Because honestly, our audience our congregation is mainly mature, okay? There's not, like, you know, we get new Christians in and stuff like that, but most of us are mature. And, you know, as mature Christians, I encourage us to start practicing this discipline. And also, too, during this fast, we're going to post a devotional every day. We're going to post a fasting devotional every day for encouragement, for prayer, right, different things together. And so if you want to fast, there is a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center. Okay, you can sign that up. Make sure your email is correct because I'm going to send the fast. Uh, I'm, I'm going to send the link to the to the uh, devotional through emails. All right, and also too, all this is kind of condensed into a a paper at the Welcome Center as well. So if you're more interested about it, I've tried to kind of condense this into uh, a few pages so you can take it home, you can read it, pray about it, whatever you want to do. And if you want to try it, you know, if you don't want to make a decision today, then you can sign up next Sunday as well. And that's why I did it like that. So that way we all have enough time to consider it, pray about it, make sure it's something we want to do, and, you know, figure out how long that you want to do this. And so, you know, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I will say this, though. If you decide to fast, 
be ready, right? Because there's going to be some temptation coming. Because for one thing, we got an enemy, and he knows how powerful fasting is. So he's going to, it's going to be one of them things where, like, somebody's just going to walk up to you and hand you your favorite dessert. Like, the weirdest things happen when you fast, you know? It's like, you've never made me a cherry cheesecake ever, and this is the week you decide to do that? Really? I go, like, here, man, here's a free ticket to the golden crowd, right? Like, go eat all the buffet you want. Really? So, yeah, so be careful because your favorite foods are going to pop up. Be strong. Also, too, watch for distractions. This is when the enemy is going to do some stuff in your home, at work, whatever. He's going to try to keep you busy. And I get it. We have obligations that at the same time don't get so distracted and just these small obligations that we lose out on our Bible reading time. And I do encourage you to try to at least do some object fast, right? Like if you're going to food fast, try to at least stay off the cell phone as much as you can. Right? Try to unplug from the TV as much as you can, okay? Because that's, you know, because it's like God said. You're fasting, but you're still doing the same old things you were doing during your fast. Right? So let's, if we're going to do it, do it right, man. Do it right. Keep it, uh, you know, like I say, man. Just, you know, take it to the maximum benefit. So if you want to sign up, you can. If not, you want to wait a week. That's awesome. So I hope we all today have learned something about this fasting and how much it plays in our lives. I hope we pray about it. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing the things that we learn. It's amazing how closer we get to God. It's amazing how much we grow spiritually when we subtract from the flesh and add to the spirit. It's just amazing the benefits that we truly receive from this and how God just, I mean, we just feel God more. It's such a great thing. And like I say, I hope I encourage everybody enough to try this. So in a moment, I'm going to pray. And, uh, you know, I want us to think about this. I want God to speak to our spirits and, and, and tell him what it looks like for each one of us personally. And like I say, if you need the stuff from the Welcome Center, please grab it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. God, I thank you for how you've given us these ways in order to grow closer to you. I mean, because, God, this is born out of the fact that you do not want to leave us alone. God, this is born out of the fact that, that, that you have stayed with mankind. Even though we have rebelled, even though we have sinned, even though we turn our backs, God, you still give us these ways in order to help us. God, you know that we, we, we have replacements for you all the time. You know that we run to food so often or we run to social media or we run to things of this world, God, whenever you're knocking at the door, when you're knocking at the door of our hearts and you're saying, I'm here, I'm here. You can ask me for that. You can spend time with me right now. And, God, we're just so used to doing this, we don't even realize that we are replacing you. And, God, you could walk away. You could say, okay, I'm tired of asking because, God, honestly, if we kept asking somebody to do that and they kept denying us, we'd probably leave them alone. But you don't. You are faithful and you are true. And God, you know how tough fasting is for human beings, Lord. We are driven by our stomachs. <laughs> we are driven by society. But you honor it for that reason. And so God, as we Reflect in our hearts right now as we consider this. Help us be strong. Help us have this resolve. Help us to know what this looks like today. Does it start with a one day, a three day? Are we ready for a week? What is it in our lives that block us off from you that we need to cut out? And God, we know that you'll be with us and you'll give us strength and you'll help us every step of the way. So God, I pray as we gather together as a body of believers to fast and to pray and to seek your face, God, I pray that you bless this. I pray that you are with us. I pray that you give us your presence like none other. God, and I know you will, God. So, God, as we seek your face, help us, shape us, mold us. We thank you for this, and we love you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.